We are so excited to feature Work Human's podcast, How We Work, on People Forward Network. Work Human is an admirable brand moving people forward, and this content on How We Work is exceptional. I'm pretty sure that this listen that you're about to experience will spark joy and inspiration. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to How We Work from Work Human. This is a podcast about the trends, issues, relationships, and phenomena that shape our workplaces and, by extension, our broader lives. My name is Dr. Misha Ann Martin, and I am the Senior Director of People Analytics and Research here at WorkHuman. I am so excited to be here today with my colleague, Dr. Isha Vicaria. Let me start out by telling you a little bit about Dr. Isha. Isha is a social psychologist and researcher on the Work Human IQ team. She, as am I, we are really passionate about showing the impact of positive work practices. In partnership with Work Human customers, Isha delivers insights on the impact of social recognition, both within and beyond the workplace. Additionally, Isha is one of the driving forces behind our external workforce surveys, like the one we will be discussing today. So at least twice a year, WorkHuman sends out surveys to people in the workforce and asks questions about things we think are particularly important at that time. It is our intent to provide thought leadership around things you may not even be thinking about yet that we think you need to think about in order to provide a positive work experience for people. So this very last survey that we did focused quite a lot on the experiences of people who were working fully remote versus people who were working hybrid versus people who are fully on site. We surveyed more than 2,200 people working in the UK, US, Ireland, and Canada. So this was the international version of our survey. And we learned quite a lot. Obviously, the world today is very different than it was before the pandemic about three years ago. I think before the pandemic, organizations were quite hesitant about people working remotely. And as a result of the pandemic, we had to just adjust and figure it out. And so most organizations ended up having people doing remote work. And now, as we are, I hope, (laughs) on the tail end of this thing, what our survey is saying is that at least 25% of people are working remotely at least some of the time. And then in certain industries, this number is even higher. So thinking about banking and finance, software and services, government and nonprofit, business and professional services, in those industries, at least 70% are hybrid. Even in industries that are traditionally fully on site, like education and manufacturing, we're seeing pockets of people working remotely at least some of the time. So Isha, Can you tell us a little bit about what the data says in terms of the impact of this trend that we're seeing? So what are the differences in impact between people who are fully remote versus those who are hybrid versus those who are fully on site? Yeah, absolutely. And happy to be here talking to you about data. So you're right. In this most recent survey, we focused on the different ways of working and those experiences and how they're different and how some are the same. But one thing that really stood out to me is how different remote workers are from the two other groups we studied, fully on-site and hybrid workers. What hybrid and on-site workers share is at least some face-to-face time with colleagues and the experience of collaborating and impromptu meetings in the office. But what they also share, hybrid and on-site workers, is significantly higher ratings of connectedness to company culture and to their colleagues compared to fully remote workers. So why does connectedness matter? Because we also saw that job-seeking intentions are significantly related to connectedness. So the likelihood of someone saying they will be looking for a new job is higher the less connected they feel at work. So this is telling us there's something very important about connection at work. But we know from previous work that there's a lot that goes into employee engagement and retention, including meaningful work, recognition, work-life balance, among other things. 
So connectedness is super important, but it's only one piece of the retention puzzle. I love that you're calling out this idea of retention being a multifaceted thing. I think sometimes we like to think that there's a one-to-one relationship between what people are feeling and experiencing and whether or not they intend to leave, when the reality is it's a number of things. So right now, most employers are moving to more of a hybrid model of working. I think that what they're thinking is, okay, so this remote thing is happening. We can't fully back off from it. Let's do this hybrid working in order to experience the best of both worlds. So can you tell us a little bit more about the hybrid working experience specifically and how we should be thinking about that? Yeah, absolutely. So what's really interesting about the hybrid work experience is that on paper, you would assume that it's the best of both worlds a little bit of home, a little bit of in-office, face-to-face time. But what we're seeing is with the result of the survey is that despite having higher levels of connectedness to company culture, hybrid workers were actually more likely to indicate they'd be looking for a new job in the next 12 months compared to the other two groups. And what we're also seeing is that hybrid workers and on-site workers have higher stress and higher feelings of being overworked, like they have too much work to do compared to fully remote workers. Now, what's interesting to me when I think about hybrid is a concept in psychology called context and state-dependent memory. This is a phenomenon that when you're studying in school, you're more likely to remember items on a test. For example, if you studied the material while you're hungry, and you take the test while you're hungry as well. So you're in the same state in both instances. You're also more likely to remember something if your environment is the same at the time of learning or encoding. So you're in the same type of room, the same type of chair. You're more likely to remember that information if the context cues are the same. Now, the connection here to hybrid working is that hybrid workers may be having a hard time with the context switching between two different environments throughout the week. It may make it difficult to get into the right headspace for work and focus. And this could be why we're seeing hybrid workers feeling more overworked and more stressed because they're trying to excel in two different modes of working. Wow, that is really interesting. So as you know, Dr. Isha, I was born and raised in Jamaica. I speak dialect, I live in the US, I have family in both Jamaica and England. So I feel like I code shift quite a bit, but I never thought about code shifting as it relates to work or even to hybrid working, but it makes a lot of sense. I think it's a very new and interesting way to think about this experience of hybrid working. So another hot topic is wellness. Everybody's talking about wellness right now. And I think it's because the pandemic was so tough for pretty much anybody, I would say. So are there any impacts that we can see of ways of working in terms of wellness, in terms of how people are doing? I think what we're uncovering here in diving into the hybrid experience and seeing it's not as perfect as we'd assume based on how it seems on paper is that mental health and wellness plays a big role in job-seeking intentions and work experience. So we asked employees in our survey who work remote at least some of the time whether they feel obligated to work while sick. And while a big proportion, 44% of remote workers, said that they do, an even greater proportion, 52% of hybrid workers, say they feel obligated to work while they're feeling sick. So despite feeling higher on connection, the fully on-site and hybrid workers are significantly more stressed and having higher ratings of feeling overworked compared to remote workers. And I think that is something that can't be understated. The flexibility that goes along with remote work is really tying into an employee's wellness and stress levels and their overall well-being. And when we look at the experience of working parents in particular, this is a group with significantly higher levels of stress and burnout than non-parents. And we saw this in our last survey. We saw this again in this survey. Parents have a lot on their plates. But when you look at parents who work fully remote, their stress levels and their burnout levels are actually on par with non-parents. The difference was actually quite noticeable. And as a working mom myself, it actually was really cool to see my lived experience in the data. 
any working parent can relate to the struggle of the morning rush. Every morning, the breakfast and the lunch and getting the shoes and socks on the little feet to get to daycare and get out the door on time. It's always a rush. And if you're working remote, you can turn around and head back home and turn on your laptop in peace with your coffee rather than run through the checklist of, do I have my keys? Do I have my lunch? Do I have enough gas in the car to get to work? Am I going to be home in time? That endless chatter before the workday even begins. So for me, the remote experience helps me feel focused and calm enough to do good work. And I think that's resonating in the experience of working parents working fully remote as well. So what's coming out of all of this is that we're finding that there isn't one perfect way of working. There are nuances and pros and cons to both. And there's a compound effect of connectedness at work and wellness that plays into the job seeking experience. Remote workers might be enjoying the benefits of flexibility, but also missing out on other rich experiential things that make someone feel connected at work. Hybrid workers may find the switching between two environments stressful and difficult. I think what really matters is that an employee gets a say in how and when they work, and also the acknowledgement that for some employees, bringing your whole self to work may mean not physically being in the office all the time. Wow, Isha, a lot stood out to me in what you just said. So the first thing that I'd like to pick up and comment on is, you know, feeling like you have to work while you're sick. I remember coming into the office and <laughs> being sick and coughing on my poor coworkers, sorry y'all, because <laughs> I was afraid that my employer would think I was a slacker if I didn't show up. I guess I was afraid that they would think that I wasn't really sick. So I'm really hoping that things change around that where it becomes more okay to say, hey, I'm sick and I just want to focus on becoming well instead of trying to work, regardless of how you're working. The second thing is your experience as a working mom. Currently, as we're recording this, I am actually sitting in England, visiting my sister-in-law, my brother, and my niece for the first time since the pandemic. And, you know, I have a newfound appreciation for what it takes to get a kid off to school. I will tell you though, Isha, it sounds like <laughs> your young son has a case of what my niece used to call the wiggle bumps, mm -hmm. and <laughs> which makes it hard to get the socks on the little feet. Yeah. And I promise you that gets better and that they settle down. <laughs> it's still hard, but they settle down. The other thing I heard you talk about was choice and pros and cons between the different ways of working. And essentially what I hear you saying is based on the workforce strategy that an organization chooses or endorses, we just have to come up with different strategies and approaches that aligns to the pros and cons of that particular way of working. So when people choose which way works best for them and their particular situation, we have to be equipped to appropriately support that so that everybody can have a positive work experience. So basically, though, what we're seeing in the data is that right now, fully remote workers are coming out ahead in terms of managing workload, and people who do not work fully remote all the time are coming out ahead in terms of relationships and connectedness. Can you give us any more color or insights around how the different groups are thinking and feeling as it relates to work? Yeah, absolutely. I think the choice is such an important aspect here. And another way to look at the experience of remote workers and hybrid and on-site workers, we asked employees, when things are changing at your organization, how do you most often feel? So there were a variety of possible responses. You could pick indifferent or hostile or excited. But what stood out the most is that the remote workers had a clear consensus around feeling uneasy. Remote workers picked this item, feeling uneasy, more than items like indifferent or excited, and they picked this item more than hybrid and on-site workers. And what this says to me is that remote workers are exhibiting a lack of connection in part because they lack a sense of confidence and trust and insight into what's happening around them in their organization. They may feel left out. This is such an important insight. First of all, I am really proud that we ask people about how they're feeling. Work Human is all about bringing humanity back to work. And so often we hear 
all this information, especially as we're talking about the great resignation, people are talking percentages and statistics, but not about how people feel. And so I'm really proud that we're thinking about and asking about that. So let's go ahead and talk about the great resignation. Talk about another hot topic. I feel like everybody is talking about this right Mm -hmm. now, but when I see this in the media, What I tend to hear and what I see people talking about, as I said before, is the statistics and the percentage of people looking for a new role. And we have that information as well. So based on this last research report and the one we did before, actually, 36% of people are saying that they intend to look for a job in the next 12 months. However, that number is significantly higher in Ireland. In Ireland, it's 47%. Also, nearly half of our job seekers are millennials between 25 to 40 years of age. Working parents are slightly more likely to be looking for a job. And 50% of people who started a new job during the pandemic report planning to look for a new job. So they're more likely to be job seekers. So said another way in putting all of this together, there's no one more likely to be looking for a job than someone who works hybrid is a parent, lives in Ireland, is between the ages of 25 and 40, and started a new job during COVID. I think it really helps to dig into the different pockets of people and working experience to understand the nuances behind that broader general number. So talking about feelings, right? Everybody's talking about this great resignation in a certain way, but I still think that there are some aspects of this thing that we haven't really talked about as much, that really do need to be talked about. One of those things, in my opinion, is the impact to the stayers. How are they feeling and how are they experiencing this on a personal level when they're seeing people around them in the organization leave, but they're still there? So Isha, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mishan. We can think about who are the flight risks and what are the groups who have higher job-seeking intentions But what's left out of that conversation, as you said, is the feeling behind the people who are seeing this happen and remain behind. So to get at this kind of experience in our survey, we posed the question, have you perceived an increase in people leaving your organization in the past year? And 50% of respondents said yes. So that right there is giving us a subjective experience of the great resignation that adds a different perspective to the conversations around workforce statistics and exits and job-seeking intentions. That's people's experience. Employees have definitely noticed and have felt this great resignation in real life. So out of the 50% of people who have perceived the turnover increase, 48% of them say they're looking for a new job. That's over 10 percentage points higher than the rate across the whole survey. What that's telling us is that there's this undeniable ripple effect in seeing that your coworkers are leaving for other opportunities, leading you to think about leaving as well. Of the people who perceived an increase in turnover, the most common feeling among them is that their workload has increased. This is not surprising because higher turnover means fewer people to get work done, plus all of the effort that goes into backfilling roles and training and getting new employees up to speed. There's just a lot of work to do and a lot of change. Thank you, Isha. So basically, people are more likely to feel an increased workload when people around them leave, and it has an impact on whether or not they in turn want to leave. Exactly. All right. I want to go back to something I mentioned previously and talk a little bit more about it. So I mentioned previously that around 50% of people who started a new job in COVID report planning to look for a new job. Now, Isha, I started a new job during the pandemic, this job during the pandemic, as you know, I just want you to know, I am not part of that 50%. I am (laughs) not planning to look (laughs) for a new job. But let's talk about that a little bit more. What do we know about people hired during the pandemic? And how does what we know help explain that statistic? So I'm so glad, Jan. As someone who's also started during the pandemic, there are a couple of things we can talk about with that population of employees hired during COVID. First of all, they're significantly more burned out, stressed, and overworked, unfortunately. 
But also the majority of them, 70%, say they onboarded remotely. Now, we just got done talking about the experiences of remote workers and how they're less connected than the fully on-site and hybrid workers. So there's something unique about starting a new job amidst all the uncertainty and pandemic-related anguish that is affecting these workers, and they're doing it all remotely. Yeah, so both you and I onboarded remotely, and I don't know about you, but I did feel some kind of anxiety around that. It was rough. So knowing that there is definitely something different about that experience, what do you think we should be doing differently? What does the data have to say about that? So clearly, talent acquisition and management teams have had to quickly pivot and learn and adjust to new ways of hiring and onboarding. And just to take a second to recognize all of the hard work that went into making that happen during unprecedented times. But In the past two years, they've had to build a bridge while walking on it. But now that we know how vulnerable this population of new hires is during the global pandemic, we can't just treat them like any other cohort. Welcoming new hires with something like a welcome award is the first thing you can do to standardize the experience for all new hires. But for COVID new hires, this group might need an extra touch point or check-in to gauge how they're doing and how they're handling the workload, how they're fitting in to the company culture. And taking the conversation back to remote workers, we've had a lot to say about them this podcast, but we actually dove even deeper into the experience of remote workers by separating them into groups who say their organization celebrates life events and those who say they don't. And when I say life events, I mean personal milestones like getting married, having a baby, buying a house. We wanted to understand the experiences of remote workers whose companies do those things, even though they're remote. And there were actually pretty big differences where the remote workers who say their companies do celebrate those personal milestones had levels of connectedness to company culture and to their colleagues on par or even higher than hybrid and on-site employees. That's super encouraging because it means there's a simple strategy for bringing remote workers onto the same level of connectedness as other workers. And that's just recognizing their whole human experience. Wow, this is so good and so interesting. So what I hear you saying is that we need to give people hired during the pandemic a little extra love and attention, including especially if people are remote, celebrating people's personal accomplishments and who they are, not just inside of work, but outside of work. So recognizing when somebody's gotten a new pet or a new baby or run a marathon, what I hear you saying is that can make a really big difference in terms of connectedness, particularly for people who are fully remote. But what are people saying in terms of whether or not they want their organizations to do this sort of thing? And if their organizations are actually doing this sort of thing? Yeah, that's a good question because we want to make sure people actually want this, (laughs) celebrating (laughs) the, the whole human experience and personal milestones. And unsurprisingly, yes, in our survey, 66% of workers said they would appreciate more opportunities to celebrate personal life events at work. And yet 54% of organizations don't currently celebrate those events. And of those, 21% said their company used to celebrate prior to COVID-19. And that 21% is so sad to me because that's saying that those are companies that used to do this. They used to celebrate these personal human events, but lost the practice somewhere down the way during COVID. I get it. It's harder now, but it's not impossible. The norm used to be in the office, it was somebody's job to get a birthday card at the CVS or the Walgreens and make sure everyone signs it and nobody's left out. And we can still get at this experience online and have just as meaningful celebrations without leaving anybody out and integrating all different modes of working. So Isha, I still have some of those cards, I've got to tell you. I'm pretty I'm pretty sentimental. All right. So we've talked about welcoming people and making their experience at the organization great. What we haven't yet talked about, and I think that this is something that we rarely talk about, but we should talk about. We haven't talked about how to make the experience more human when people leave an organization. So now I'll tell a little personal story of my own. 
not too long ago, actually this happened right before the pandemic. Talk about a stressful year. Mm -hmm. I was laid off actually twice in the course of a year. And in both cases, it is a lot and it felt pretty rough, especially right before a global pandemic. Can you imagine doing a job search at that time? Yeah, no point. Bueno. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, I fully understood and supported the decision to eliminate my position. You know, sometimes things happen and that is the right call. And in both cases, I believe that it was the right call, but it was really a tale of two layoffs, if you will. In the first case, I had a really, really tough time. And it's interesting because I was already planning to leave that organization. In fact, I was only about two weeks away from an offer letter at a new organization. So it's not like I was planning to stay or anything, but I really had a tough time with it. And I had a lot of bitter feelings and it was because of how it was done. I felt like they did not honor the contributions that I made while I was there, even though I was there for about four years. I mean, they asked me for my computer bag back. They never even gave me a computer bag. It was awful. And clearly I'm still salty about it. <laughs> so <laughs> in the second case, however, I was not planning to leave that organization. I love that job. I loved my team. And I was really sad when that experience came to an end but I was not bitter. I was not bitter at all. And that's because of how they did it. It was infinitely more human. My leader approached the whole situation with incredible humanity and empathy and made sure that he emphasized to me, my team, the rest of the organization, that he valued the contributions that I made while I was there. And this was not a performance related decision. I had only been there for five months. So it meant a lot to me how we did it. The second organization, in fact, is an organization that provides services. And to this day, I still utilize their services. I am a proud customer of this organization. So to bring it back to our current conversation, I think it's really important for us to be thinking about this and talking about this right now, because we're seeing a trend of people returning or intending to return to previous organizations. So yeah. Isha, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. When we talk about making work more human, we really mean maintaining that human experience throughout the whole employee life cycle. That's including exits. And this is something I've heard you say that every organization should consider former employees as brand ambassadors to friends, family, and even future colleagues. And you just gave a great example of that. What's interesting based on our survey results is that we saw 62% of employees who say they're looking for a new job, say they'd consider going to a former employer. So that means making that exit experience a human experience is probably more important now than ever. So it's a nice thing to do, but it's also a smart thing to do because people can come back with all the learnings from the new place that they went to. We actually have a new boomerang on our team. So <laughs> shout out to Greg. Greg was... <laughs> hired and left right before I joined Fort Human, and he is recently back, and we are so delighted to have him. All right, so now let's switch to our last hot topic. Let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is so important to talk about. It always is, but I feel like it's especially important right now, given some of the recent events in the United States. Some people refer to those events in 2020 as dual pandemics. So one, of course, being the global pandemic and the other being civil unrest in the United States, kicked off by the George Floyd murder. So what did this last survey tell us about the importance of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion to employees? You're so right, Mishan. And I have a lot of things to say on this <laughs> topic. But the first bringing it back to our survey, we asked employees, how important is diversity, equity, inclusion for you in terms of staying at your organization? And 72% agreed that it's somewhat or very important. That's a huge proportion. But that huge proportion was even bigger for some demographics, including Black employees. And it even seemed to increase linearly with younger generations, meaning that the younger an employee is, the more likely they'll endorse saying d and is important to them. So there's a few things we can talk about with DNI being so clearly top of mind for so many employees. The first is participation in ERG groups and buy-in and even, dare I say it, 
compensation (laughs) and recognition from senior leadership. This is something that's gaining traction in HR spaces. We're seeing some of our own clients use their recognition platform to reward the good work being done in ERG groups to promote inclusivity, to promote belongingness among different demographic groups at work. I think that's so important. So a second thing to talk about is recognition. So recognition is our bread and butter. We know the insights of recognition in and out. And some of the work that I've been involved with with Work Human IQ has demonstrated better outcomes when minority groups are recognized. I'm thinking specifically of our finding that hospital units whose female and non-white employees have higher rates of recognition, have higher patient satisfaction than those with less recognition among those groups. I think that's so important to underscore how recognizing all different types of employees at work has outcomes, not just within the group, but in and outside of work. And third, tying back to another psychology-related concept centered around the positive effects of witnessing thanks being given publicly. In our survey, we asked employees whether they see their organization as a place where everyone is thanked publicly for their contributions at work. And employees who agree with this have better outcomes than those that don't in terms of connection, but also in terms of respect and psychological safety. So there's something special about recognition being visible in creating a culture of gratitude, especially among marginalized groups, and especially for inclusive behavior. And the more we can do to amplify and reinforce inclusivity, the more DNI is something that is put into practice and not just talked about. Wow. So first of all, Isha, you can always say compensation on this podcast, (laughs) compensation, 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 compensation. (laughs) Second of all, you know, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. So first of all, what we're seeing is that DEI has an impact in terms of retention. All employees consider this to be important. If you want to get the next generation of workers, you better be good at this. And this has implications for other outcomes as well. I absolutely love that patient satisfaction study. Well, all right, we've come to the end of our podcast. I can't say thank you enough, Dr. Isha, for all this knowledge that you dropped and all these data-driven insights and recommendations. My pleasure. It has been my absolute pleasure (laughs) at doing this podcast with you. Two lady PhDs in the house. When does that happen? (laughs) And thank you all to the listeners. Thank you to everyone listening. For more stories, insights, podcasts, and videos about how we work, head to workhuman.com. You can also follow us on all social channels. We're at WorkHuman. Please also subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find in the show notes. How We Work is produced by Mike Lovett and edited and mixed by Rob Valois. We will see you with a new episode in a few weeks. At People Forward Network, we love this show, how we work, and we love the Work Human platform. If you have never experienced their platform, do it. Set up a demo to experience the difference in a software that moves employees forward. And if you don't know about Work Human live events, oh, you are missing out. And by the way, if you're looking for more episodes from Work Human, you can go direct to their show, How We Work, and follow or start to listen from anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Links to all this goodness in the show notes. We'll see you next time.